Everybody. I'm really excited to be here today and I'm joined by the fabulous Theo Baker, who's the Head of Innovation at an Irish Challenger Bank, and Ricardo Moretti. He uh, runs the Agile Restaurant in Chelsea, London. So we're going to talk today about three things, the innovation imperative, why we need to innovate. We're going to talk about changing a more traditional culture um, and how you bring innovation in. And we're going to give you some really pragmatic tips on how to innovate even if you're running a restaurant or changing to an entirely different business model. So we live in interesting times. I hear this often quoted as a Chinese curse. If you want to curse someone, you say, may you live in interesting times. I don't know about the source for that. Not so great, but it's, it's a really interesting one because interesting can be both challenging or maybe an opportunity to do something quite different. So rapid change is disrupting large companies. The Fortune 500 shows us that since 2000, 52% of the Fortune 500 has ceased to exist. So let that sink in for a moment and think about today, all of these gigantic companies we know so well, maybe they're not going to be around, half of them may not be around in the future. So what, what are the things that cause these big disruptions? At the moment, obviously the pandemic, that's disrupting our supply chain, political challenges, everything from Brexit to trade embargoes, which means we can't get the goods as we wanted to before. Um, regulatory changes. Uh, one of the big ones is having zero carbon in the construction industry. So people I talk to in that industry say, you know, that they can't even gain contracts. They can't um, get licenses unless they go after the zero carbon approach. So that, that's got a big disruption to their industry. Social pressure. Um, companies find that people won't buy for them if they're not even aligned to their political views. We have massive economic uncertainty. Teo is going to talk more about this in her sector, but they get daily disruption. And if you look at even things like all the cryptocurrencies, digital, um, that's got the potential to change everything we know. And maybe even banks aren't going to exist in the future. Then we have climate change. Um, you probably saw in the news recently with Texas, how, what was it, something like 4.5 million people were without power when you got this massive storms ripping through there and all the fires we're seeing, even in places like Canada, where they're having the hottest weather they've ever recorded. So these have a massive change, even on getting goods and um, supporting people. Then in the supply chain and security, um, it, it's fascinating. That's one of the biggest growth areas and one of the biggest um, risk factors for many companies at the moment. The uh, colonial pipeline in America, where hackers got in and they managed to take over and create ransomware within the system. So they actually had to pay it or the entire um, oil pipelines were out on the whole Eastern seaboard of America, right? From New York to Texas. And we don't even know what's out there. This is the time of what I call gaining massive situational awareness. If we don't look outside and understand the patterns and have a much better idea of what's going on, we're open to being disrupted and um, being taken out by everything. However, as I said, it's, it's also a time of hope. We have incredible technology coming. And if we can use that, exploit it, see what's coming that we can leverage, there's fantastic things. I mean, I, I love the idea of people editing genes. I mean, I wouldn't do it myself, but I love the idea of it. 3D printing, everything from printing your organs to people who want to go into space and now looking whether they can use space dust and materials on other planets to be able to print out replacement parts for their spaceship. How cool is that, right? So there's all these fantastic things we could do out there. And it's, it's all at our disposal if we can use it and leverage it. So we must innovate. That's not even a question. And I'm just going to pause for a moment and talk about what is innovation. You know, you see people, I've read quite weird explanations about creating value for people. I'm like, what does that mean? So for me, innovation is about solving real world problems and solving them with novel solutions, finding really the simplest, interesting ways to solve these sometimes very wicked problems. And I think we do all innovate. Maybe we need to learn to innovate a little bit better. So what's happening in the innovation space? We have what we call the core innovation going on. This is what I think companies probably spend at least 70% of their time doing. So in core, this is what we keep call the keep the lights on strategy. So this is where you might be innovating incrementally and doing things like uh, bringing in agile and lean 
helping um, your existing systems and processes. You might be doing what you do better, right? So your existing products and services, you do them in a better way. Then we have the, what we call that sort of adjacent um, innovation. This is what we call the keep up strategy. So you're looking out at what other people are doing. You're trying to be a fast follower or trying to take ideas that exist and these are new to you. Then the third category is that transformational innovation, right? This is what we call the shoot for the stars. This is the stuff with things like SpaceX, like literally shooting for the stars, saying, hey, our planet's in a bit of trouble at the moment. Maybe we need to go and populate other planets. Don't know what the rest of the world universe would think of that, <laughs> but uh, this is the shoot for the stars. We want to be aiming to do something more. And why pursue these bigger opportunities? So it's quite interesting. Um, there's been some reports showing that if you spend your money, you know, if people spend what we call the 70, 20, 10, 70 percent on your core innovation, 20 percent on that sort of adjacent incremental and 10 percent on that transformational. And yet sometimes the returns are flipped. Right. So you can get 70 percent back on that transformational innovation. Now, one of the reasons people don't just pursue that um, is it can be quite risky. So especially for very traditional players, this is hard for them to do, but we do need to have a portfolio, right? Both to manage the risk and to manage the opportunities. We want to have a mix of these things. It's like people might buy a house and then they might buy some cryptocurrency. You have that sort of risk and stable options in there. Now, the challenges with innovation, what are those challenges? Well, one of the things we see a lot, we're an agile conference, right? And um, you see this focus on building it right. People get stuck very much in let's improve what we have. We're going to do retrospectives and do this small innovation. And that's brilliant. We need that to be able to do the bigger innovation. But if all you do is get stuck building what you're doing now, you're pretty much building this idea of faster, better horses, right? So if you look at a company like a Tesla, um, they might be constantly innovating their cars, but if they don't keep up or do something a little different in the future, maybe what they do already will go away, just like um, traditional cars when are going away with electric cars. So on the other side, we have the ideation kind of innovation space where people are like, oh, let's run a, a wonderful ideation workshop. We'll bring in some design thinking. We'll bring in these creative thinkers. And so they come up with an amazing amount of ideas. Everyone's very excited. Yet if you don't have the discipline and the ability to get these ideas out, that's where all good ideas go to die. Right? They go to the idea graveyard. So that there's so many companies who had these ideas early, but they never managed to actually see the light of day. So how do we get from this? This is the original car to this. This is one of the first electric vehicles. And how cool is that? I kind of love her outfit. I think, Teo, next talk, we need to be sporting that and driving up in a little electric car um, to this. And this is the first Tesla Roadster. I'm actually with Jeff Sutherland. I remember we were running an Agile class in Silicon Valley. He went, let's go for a test drive. So we ran up and, man, that thing was fast, right? We just, you put the foot down and we just took off onto the motorway. It was a little scary at first. We just weren't quite used to it, but super fun. Now, again, if you look back at that original electric vehicle, yeah, it's electric, but it wasn't, you know, this is the problem when people talk about just going after something like, let's make it sustainable and green. Yeah, but you know what? As soon as you make it sexy, everybody wants it. So you want to go after this understanding the customer experience while you're innovating. And that's what companies um, do well. Now, this last one, I don't know if you've come across this, but I really love uh, what Ford's been doing. This is the Ford F-150 pickup truck. Now, if you think about what an, is an electric vehicle, well, really, it's a lot of batteries powering that thing, right? That's a big power generator. So they took this idea and they um, turned it into meeting a customer need. So in this case, when they went out and looked at what people were really doing with their vehicles, they saw construction workers and people going camping. And what they'd do is they'd load it up with their own power generator because they're often in remote areas or areas where the electricity wasn't turned on. So they obviously rethought that and thought, well, hey, guess what? Our truck's actually a power generator. So now let's make it so that people can plug directly in. And the idea of innovation, I love the fact that it sparked the planet. We have a porter in our building in London. And when I walked past the other day, we were talking about innovation, as one does. <laughs> and, and the guy was like, oh, it's amazing what they're doing with vehicles. And the idea is that 
later, we'll be able to plug them in when we get home and actually they will be their own power source. They will power our houses. We'll be able to drive to work, plug them in and power the whole building, right? So this beautiful convergence now of technology, all those political needs, planetary needs for sustainability, renewables, all that's coming together in a very exciting way. So this is Mobius, right? If we talk about how to innovate, what we try to do is balance up the idea of building the right thing, building it right, right? We want to make sure that we can leverage and build up this innovation muscle. You need those core ability. Um, I love that saying, if you want to do different things, you need to do things differently. So we need to build up that innovation muscle, but make sure that we have that way of disrupting ourselves to look at ideas in a new way. So we go through this discovery options delivery, right? There's three parts of it to take us through from idea to execution. And it's a feedback loop. We do this very, very quickly. So that the key parts of it, and you can start anywhere on this loop, right? This is completely non-prescriptive, um, but we usually start with the question, why are we doing it? What problems are we trying to solve? Who are we try solving those problems for? You know, this is where Ford went out into the field, saw what was going on firsthand. If they only stayed at work in the workshops, they wouldn't be able to make those great insights, those connections that come up with the innovation. Then we target the outcomes. This becomes our compass to tell us, hey, this is where we want to head to. And that way, if we deviate, we can understand why. We can drive deeper insights. We generate ideas. Here are all the brilliant things we possibly could do. Now we need to decide which ones should we go after. And part of doing that is that constant experimentation. So we run lots of research experiments and options simultaneously. And this is one of the keys. There's, there's not the same barriers we had in the early days to doing the stuff. We can get ideas out sometimes within minutes to test them out. There should be no barrier. Then we want to be able to pull together all the core, core things we do where we build our experiments, we measure the impact. There's no point building a lot of stuff if you don't know how well your stuff is making an impact, right? So we learn. It, it's all about generating a lot of learning and generating that rapidly. And as we come back, we can look at this idea of do we adapt? How do we adapt? Do we have to do more discovery? Or is that experiment really cool? That got a lot of hits. Let's push that one out live. Or, you know what, we were off base. We thought we knew what the problem was. Or, you know what, this is not a good business to be in. We need to pivot and do something completely differently. So we go between the simultaneously exploring ideas and exploiting them. And you can use the same pattern. It's a self-similar pattern. We can apply whether we're doing our organizational strategy, building products, services, operations. Um, again, want to be really tool and framework agnostic with this. I think if we want to innovate, we need to have a process that innovates with us. It needs to evolve. So what I find is everybody, we think of this as a strategic design toolkit. We all have our own tools we like, our ways of working. And so we should give people the flexibility to mix and match those. Um, it's been used from everything. Red Hat runs all their innovation labs with it. World Health's been using it. Airbus, Defense and Space, lots of banks. And one of my favorites is Social Impact. Um, these people, Peace Through Prosperity, are going into places like Pakistan, heavily radicalized areas, going into Yemen in a war zone. And they're actually making a massive difference, helping people improve their own lives. So now we're going to go over to Teo. Cool, thank you. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much, Gabrielle, for that. Um, I'm Teo Baker, and I'm absolutely delighted to be talking to you about just do it. Kickstarting your innovation culture. And I'd like to share a quote with you. Everyone you meet knows something you don't know. So be willing to learn from them. And that's how I feel about Gabrielle and definitely Ricardo. And one of the things that I wanted to create in my challenger bank was to create a culture of being curious, creative, and imaginative. So I'm going to talk to you about our journey. And as Gabrielle mentioned, all industries are facing disruption and financial services, absolutely, they know different. And we've seen the pandemic has disrupted us, unfortunately, really severely, but it's also forced customers 
to want things quicker, faster, um, want access to finance and better products. Um, we're seeing our competitors being much more agile than ourselves. And this is just disrupting everything we do, especially with fintechs just booming immediately every day, together with all the regulatory change. And we are seeing pockets of change accelerating things. Now, you could argue these are forcing change and innovation, and absolutely they are. However, you could be stuck with internal challenges. And some of our internal challenges are a legacy culture. And with that, we have information overload. So we have tons of information from customer segmentation to data to too many processes and inconsistent ways of doing things. And I'm sure this left loop should resonate with a lot of you, our traditional mindsets. This makes us slow to innovate, definitely difficult to attract talent. And then you have your silo um, departments and all the internal politics we are all way too familiar with. And one of the things I found in, in my organization was we have lots and lots of frameworks. And I kept thinking, how can I bring people on a journey? How can I get them to still use all these frameworks, all these tools? How can I energize my colleagues? How can I find a tool or framework that's repeatable, scalable, but most important, relevant? And I was on the hunt for something. And we had a lot of Agile in our organization. And then we had Kanban, and then we had Lean. And I love most of these frameworks because they do add value. But the one thing that was missing for me was the glue, the common language across all of these. And so what I found in our organization was we were building the wrong thing faster. And I'm sure a lot of you today can actually relate to that. And then I came across Mobius. And I just loved it. Before I even knew anything about it, I loved it because it looked fluid. It embraced design thinking, which um, I love as a, as a tool. And I could see myself zooming around this loop, um, learning, improving. Um, it gave me options. It enabled me to... Um, to work with strategy, to prioritize, and most important, to deliver MPVs, MVPs, because that's what innovation is all about, all about proof of concepts and MVPs. And um, what I liked about Mobius the most was it combined all the frameworks that I just previously spoke about. So it enabled me to bring my colleagues and my organization on a journey. It was flexible. It gave us outcomes and everyone could use their own tool that they felt comfortable with. So we never excluded anything. We just embraced it. And I could still use my design thinking. And most importantly, it's visual. And I love running around my organization with one pager because we've got death by PowerPoint. So I always love showing up with one page that shows anybody where we are, what we're doing and how we're doing it. And this led us to one of our first workshops. And this was very much about um, training. So we were we got a group of people together and we did this virtually. So we were training in a virtual environment to, to, to see if this would resonate. And the type of um, people and colleagues I got around the table were those that were change makers, um, some from innovation. I got a group of grads together. I got colleagues working in research, but everybody had a common goal. They were open to new things and new ways of doing things, but they could give me relevant feedback. And our training was successful. This workshop was fantastic. Now, it looks like there's a lot, but 
every time we worked through 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 an area of the loop, we were learning more, we're exploring, we were challenging, we're doing everything that is important for innovation and for changing a culture. And everyone had a different journey and we came out of our comfort zone together. We drew for the first time, we drew some really crazy stuff, but we loved it and that's what it's all about. And then we thought, okay, now let's get a little bit more serious. Let's try something. So we found a key problem in my organization. We found a project that had already done a lot. They've been at it with the research. They've tested everything with customers. So all the things that you can think of, and they were struggling. They were like a dog chasing its tail. Their project and everything they wanted to do was just not moving. They were stuck. So we thought, let's try out the Mobius loop. Let's see if this can make a difference. Let's give this team what they really need. So they needed quick wins. They needed options because they've been chasing their tail for way too long. So we ran a four hour workshop. And in that workshop, we had your non-believers. We had open-minded colleagues. We had your doers. Everybody needs those doers. And we were um, looking at how can we unblock this. And one of the big things we realized coming out of this key workshop that the problem they thought they were trying to solve was not the right problem, that they were actually collecting the incorrect information. And yet when we started this, they all said to Gabrielle and me, well, we've done all the research. We've got all of this. We know this. Yeah, I remember that, Tay. And what was interesting is when people say, oh, we know all this stuff, we have it all. And I said, great, then this should take you 10 minutes. Let's just put down those things. Why are we doing it? Who are we doing it for? What are the problems? And you let them do this. And inevitably, that is the case. I think it almost helps you find the gaps or something, doesn't it? But I do remember you had so much data and they pulled up, they sent me stuff before the workshop going, have a look through. And there were just PowerPoints and research and, and even that research, remember I asked a couple of questions and it had been outsourced, I think. You had a research firm working on it. And so nobody had really looked at it or really understood it, right? And every time something needed to be asked, people like, oh, let's go get the research group to do it, which is so slow. Oh, absolutely. And it also costs too much of money. But the, the best thing, the aha moment, that light bulb moment that came out in this workshop was all that information and they were solving the wrong problem. Yeah. <laughs> so but th that's, that's the power of the tool. And that's why we use innovation. Because then we actually decided to step it up some more. And we decided to try out a, a real key problem. Something that could enable innovation. Something that was core to us. And... It also managed to get us into the cloud, something that will help with our customers. So um, this pandemic, they all wanted access to finance quicker. And um, so, so we were very ambitious. I was very ambitious. I wanted to, to do a lot. And we went from four hours. And I remember I pushed Gabrielle to, let's do it in three hours. And I'm wanting to get this cross-organizational team of marketing people, insights, um, risk, your traditional compliance, um, your regulatory team, um, everybody you wouldn't think would be open to a new tool. Now, some of us had seen the Mobius loop and others hadn't. So some people were coming cold. And I just said to Gabrielle, well, at the end of this, I want everybody to be change makers. I want to, us to have all those options. I want to be able to prioritize and I want to zoom around that loop and zoom around my organization and, and do something amazing. What's interesting, you know, we're all using, well, most of us are using these virtual tools now. So the not so surprising. In the old days, we could print these out, put them on the wall, get people together and have some coffee sort of chats around it. Now, this one was, you know, as Teo said, she went from a four hour workshop, which it was pretty ambitious and said, OK, you got three hours and I've invited people from the Exco and people I want to change the culture and they didn't know anything about Mobius. And she said, do you think at three hours we can get all the discovery done and give them concrete actions and delivery? So I stupidly said, yes, I'm a bit of an optimist. So we did that. We pulled it together. Now, 
when you first do this, if you look at this, this is what we call the big, beautiful mess because it is messy. So what you've got is multiple people talking at the same time. And the idea is to type this up as quickly as possible. Then we go through a bit of refinement. So we're going to show you the slightly improved one so you can see it. So we, we pretty much had to go in with a pretty clear banking models are disrupted. Um, there was an open banking regulation, which why you put in place, you can actually leverage to do something with where let's say I go to get a mortgage. Anyone who's done that before, you have to put in piles of paperwork, go and get your bank statements. It's a real pain. It takes so long. But imagine all your data is available and all the financial institutions can uh, share it. So now if you want to apply, it's a much easier process. So Taya wanted to leverage that. And she knew if they didn't do that, right, they're going to get disrupted out. Um, so many of these new neo sort of banks, fintechs are coming on their heels. And people just generally um, and genuinely needed finance. So what we did is we just quickly, we couldn't do as deep a customer discovery, and that's okay. You can go back and do it. But we'll just show you quickly what that looks like. So we start saying, well, there's too much complexity. Why is that, right? You're doing probing, you're getting data, doing a bit of research, but quickly. And while we were doing it, um, one of the questions came up when Teo said, oh, other banks don't ask for nearly as much. And I said, well, why don't you find out what they do? Because if they're bigger and imagine your Lloyds, your Barclays, et cetera, they've probably done all the hard work to figure out what's the minimum you need. So steal, stand on the shoulders of giants, grab that. It, and what we're looking for while we're doing this is quick wins. Is there anything we can do quickly that we can get out the door? So we did that with a lot of these areas, um, prioritize them, and we had outcomes really clearly. Ultimately, they want to get finance fast. There's no point putting in wonderful systems if they can't get that loan or finance they need that much faster. And if we did that well, the bank creates all their own outcomes, right? They can get more customers, improve their reputation, and go from keeping the lights on to transforming. Um, and because this was Greenfield, you're going to notice a lot of research activities. But we have big three questions. Desirability. Does anyone want it? Right? So if we come up with some amazing new product, how can we test quickly? Does anyone want it? Is it a viable business model? Something that can sustain? Can we create revenue from it? And can we actually build and support it? And I remember why we're doing this. This is why I loved her. She jumped from uh, saying, hey, well, all these partners have all these pieces that we need. And she said, you know what? Why don't I test them out? I'm going to get them to build the prototype. We need something we can find out. Can we even build it and test it with people? I'm going to try and find someone to do that. And that was one of the big action items that I think this is something would take, what, years, I think, at your bank, yeah. um, shortened down to many months. Yes, no, absolutely. And um, I remember uh, uh, um, one of our execs actually said something interesting. He said um, he has never seen so much progress in three hours than compared to all the brilliant consultants we've hired and the years of putting everybody together in the same room. <laughs> it was incredible. So, so, so yeah, so after our, our amazing workshop, I think I had a key action to go and speak to these partners. And um, I think Gabrielle was amazed because I said to her, well, within a week, I've already spoken to a partner. We've already going to get a pilot signed up. So I managed to demystify this whole myth of it can't be done. And this is what innovation is all about, trying something new, just get on with it. And uh, we managed to take, we pivoted that project. We managed to go live in 20 weeks. We got ourselves in the, in the cloud. We cut through a whole lot of myths and we did it. And just to summarize from, from my whole experience, yeah, um, is just do it. Get the buy-in from your senior execs. Get the buy-in from one person senior and just go, go, go. And don't plan too much. Actually, really make it a team sport. A team sport is about getting in there, rolling up your sleeves and just doing it, being on the same goal, um, trying to make a difference. And don't have tons of decision makers because if you have loads of decision makers, you're not going to move with speed. And don't forget, have fun along the journey. It's all about having fun, challenging yourself and making decisions so you can just do it fast. So thank you, everyone. And I'm delighted to be handing over to 
Ricardo. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Teo. That was fantastic. And uh, Gabrielle, um, as usual, everything is uh, really, really, really exciting to be here. And uh, my name is Ricardo. I have a restaurant in London. I've had the same restaurant for uh, in its current format since 1995. So we just celebrated 26 years. And uh, we've had you know, great success from day one. And uh, at about 2016, we started to uh, uh, run into some problems. You know, we, we just payroll alone had, had uh, um, risen to 40% uh, of, of turnover, whereas previously it had been running at about 25%. There were so many other issues. I was really looking for a way to, to try to stay in the business because, you know, we were, we were losing money some months and, and, making very little money other months. And uh, I either had to sort of find a solution or, 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 or exit the business altogether. I discovered uh, the Agile sort of uh, community and, and read up a lot of uh, magazines, books, and so on, specifically two books that jumped out uh, as being tremendously influential were uh, Team of Teams by General Stanley uh, uh, McChrystal. And, um, Jeff Sutherland's book, uh, or the Scrum book, uh, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. And I, I decided to stick with the Scrum framework and uh, we implemented it at the restaurant and it was tremendously successful. And we pulled the restaurant back into a profit situation in a very short period of time. Morale went right through the roof. And uh, we'd been running a flat organization for, literally from day one. And since 2016, we've been uh, uh, running the restaurants, uh, end of 2016, beginning of 2017, we've been running the restaurant without managers, uh, without head chefs, and uh, we just really had a, having a, a, a fully autonomous uh, uh, team who, you know, had a, a tremendous uh, uh, purpose and were really mastering their their their, their game, and. Um, Everything was running pretty well. Uh, up until about uh, last February 2020, we had the highest income February in history and everything was looking fantastic for that summer. And actually last summer was amazing, but unfortunately uh, we got closed down uh, and the pandemic came in and literally uh, going in, in the UK, we were in a situation where uh, we, were told at one point that we were going to try and get herd immunity and we were going to keep everything open and literally within a day or so uh, everything changed and the um, we were told uh, the next day at midnight we had to close so i was always really reluctant to uh, uh, to to close the restaurant in fact i met gabrielle uh, just before the pandemic hit, hit and we were in conversation on a regular basis about a number of different uh, projects and uh, so she was kind of here right at the very beginning and, and we were having sort of daily conference calls to sort of plan things out and see how we could uh, uh, um, uh, uh, progress and I said look I'm absolutely determined I've got to find a way not to close as a restaurant you know I, I hate the idea of closing the business uh, for a number of reasons but we need to keep momentum going and uh, we just really wanted to be of service to the community you know we have a tremendous um, uh, uh, local clientele, and we we just wanted to stay stay around and stay working. And it, I don't know anybody familiar with the UK, but this is what the supermarkets look like. And it, and it was really quite scary for a lot of people. And uh, you know, people were going. You know, all the basic necessities were just disappearing out of the supermarkets. Nobody had any information. We were. I think the UK was one of the worst countries in the world for giving out information as to what was going to happen. And um, so we decided, OK, probably the easiest thing for us to do would be to uh, uh, see if we could turn into a, a, a deli. And legally, we're allowed to do that under the terms of our lease and, and, and so on. And so uh, uh, Gabrielle calls it guerrilla research, but I, I was kind of out in the car on a regular basis going around to see all of the local shops everywhere that that I was inspired by the, the organic shops. And, and over the years, I'd, I'd always wanted to do more deli food and, and, and come up with ideas. And, and 
So that was a, a great opportunity for us to do that. And, and I just have to say, Ricardo, so humble because, um, you know, I'd be talking to him and he'd be saying, we have to keep momentum. If you lose momentum, it's so hard to get a business running again, which I think is true. And he said, you know, he said, but I had to look around and see, you know, what was going to be open. So making that leap from saying, well, we're a restaurant, but if supermarkets can be open, then how do we turn into that? And he was on calls. He'd call me walking his dog, driving the car. And I just remember one of the times, you know, he's got his phone on in the car. He's talking away and he says, hang on a minute. And you just hear, <laughs> and the car's swerving over. And he, he, you hear the car door go and he comes back going, oh, I saw this most beautiful shop that had wonderful packaging. So I've taken photos and I'll send them later. But I think this is what we need to do with our packaging. And, you know, just that immediacy, that really is guerrilla research at its best yeah i mean we were really lucky we had a really good team of people and but in a very short period of time we came up with the uh the sort of minimum minimum viable product we had our, our own uh products we started to learn to bake bread our, our bakery we couldn't get them on the phone um in fact we couldn't get lots of suppliers on the telephone and and so we were uh, constantly trying to figure out if we could do things ourselves and 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 so we learned to make sourdough bread and um People are really loving it now. Actually, in fact, now the restaurant's opened. We, we've stopped buying yeast for anything. So we make sourdough pizza and all of that. So in, in many ways, it's sort of like this whole whole uh, evolution, this forced evolution has, has been quite good. Um, we also, uh, this is a picture of me and Pash. Pash has worked with me for 25 years. Uh, we, she, she was wonderful. She was phoning everybody up and from the bookings book, everybody had been into the restaurant for the last six months and, and uh, um uh, you know, did, telling them that we were still open and, and uh, we got on the Facebook Live and did a few uh, videos. We told the, the you know, we, we have a lot of uh, um, different suppliers who support us from welders to maintenance crew and so on. And they were all really worried that they wouldn't get any work because all the local businesses were closing down. So we said, okay, we're trying to keep you you occupied. You know, we're not sure how you're going to get paid yet, but you know, you'll at least get a free meal with us, and we'll bang you a few pounds if the, if you if you help out our neighbours. And so we offered that as a a, 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 a service. Uh, Pash has got a car. I've got a car. Several of my team members could drive. So we said, okay, well, what about if you need a lift to the doctors or the the, the station? Because a lot of um, uh, really nice retired people a lot of, and a lot of our customers are single they lived on their own they were very scared and we were very the whole team was determined to sort of be there for uh, uh, for the community which Actually, is, i love that uh, little video you sent like during it i just love the small snippets but the whole team went outside um one of your neighbors places it was a, her birthday and they had a cake and they sang <laughs> happy birthday to her that was so sweet yeah, because her, her family couldn't come down. They were told they couldn't visit. And so she was there with her help and she had a lovely house and things. So so we we get, we delivered a, a birthday cake and, and a home delivery and the team sang happy birthday and she was waving at the window. We videoed it and sent it to her daughter. So she was really happy with that. But, you know, it was fun. It was, it was a, a, a it, there was a lot of good came out of it, you know, that whole situation. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, we, we went to... Um, we, we did a sort of five hour pivot uh, um, while we were still running as a restaurant the night before we started changing all our wine fridges over to uh, um, buy, you know, uh, supplying deli food. Uh, we put, started putting our, our, our wines and making displays um, uh, on, uh, you know, at the restaurant. This is kind of like the, the, the first version of it. I think we've got another picture in a minute of, of how it, uh, um, by the end of day one, how it had it, how it evolved. Um, and we were, I think we were able to do that because we've had this when in, in back in 2017, when managers and, and, and chefs left because they didn't want to give up power. So we, we said to the team, look, do you want to have a go at running the restaurant on your own? And they said yes, unanimously. And since then, they've been an autonomous self-organizing team. And I think having that mindset allowed us to not panic just stay calm and, and sort of really evaluate the situation and, 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 uh, and make change quickly and, uh, you know, a, a adapt. And we had sort of played around a lot with this Formula One. Uh, we used to play videos of the Formula One uh, um, 
uh, race cars where they change four wheels and do a full refuel in 1.92 seconds, I think is the world, world record. And, and, you know, we'd, we'd always ask, how can we be a bit more like that? You know, how can we swarm around all our work, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, and, and lately we've been using this, this thing called mob programming. So we, we really just kind of all doing each other's uh, um, uh, work uh, and, and, and helping each other out and, and uh, just kind of stealing ideas from a, what it was like when we were first in business, uh, you know, before we had a formal structure and B, looking at the Agile community and seeing what, what successful companies were doing. And, and, and we try to mimic that in the restaurant environment. And one of the fun things I know Gabrielle really likes this is uh, we played a lot of games uh, in the early days, especially when things were going well. So we would um, take, like, we, we have a saying uh, which comes from the military, which is two is one and one is none. And we try to have two of everything. And so we have two pizza ovens, for example. So you can see they're stacked on top of each other, but they have totally separate supply. But we play a game. We say, okay, let's say both of those are out of order for until 3 p.m. And we might run that on a Sunday lunch, which is really busy for pizzas with families and so on coming in. And so we can't touch the pizza oven. Uh, let, let's try and see what happens. And, and, you know, let's new team, especially with new team members, let's see how they react to it and we're not going to warn them we just come in and switch it off so you can't use that anymore and um you know we do it in a light-hearted way and they know that you know we're there to support them and so on it's kind of you know okay we've got this problem how are we going to deal with it and so we, we run lots and lots of games like that um and i love doing that in a controlled way where we put people under a lot of stress but where we can take that stress away and it's much better than that happening in real life when really bad things happen, you know, and, 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 and then they don't have the tools to prepare for that. And I think doing that over a long period of time, and that's where four or five years we've been doing that, um, I think really helped, again, get that mindset right, get the, that sort of sense of, well, we need to be able to adapt on the fly, um, you know, as we go. So, you know, the day one uh, of the pandemic, we turned the restaurant into an operations room, uh, um, Ga Gabrielle was telling me this morning about the, the D reminding me about these DHL boxes. I came out of my house because we were really worried because we, again, we couldn't get hold of our supplier that supplied uh, our packaging and boxes. So we were worried that how are we going to get things to people? So we had food to deliver, but we might not have boxes to put them in and so on and so forth. And I came out and Ryman's down the road had shut down and um, they put several hundred um uh, uh, DHL boxes in the rubbish and I, I saw that they were locking up the shop and I said you throwing those away and he go yeah because we don't know when we're going to be open again I said can I take them say yeah sure so I went and got my car drove around the front and 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 put them all in and took them back to the restaurant so we're just scavenging what we could from wherever we could um, this was first day by the end of the first day that's what the terrace looked like and on the left hand side we have mulled wine and uh, we had uh, uh, lots of picnic hampers because we thought people might want to eat out and so on. So we started doing that. Lots of dry goods, uh, wine sales and so on. We were able to keep our, our, our sales initially up pretty, pretty well uh, in, in the early days. And, uh, you know, constantly getting feedback from customers uh, and just kind of really, uh, again, you know, talking to Gabrielle, what I love about uh, this, this whole Mobius uh, loop is this constant thing of, you know, asking ourselves on the left hand side, you know, why are we doing this? You know, you know, what, who are we doing it for? You know, what are we trying to do and trying to get uh, uh, really out, outcome driven, you know, rather than output driven, uh, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute, but really good regular feedback from customers, post-its on the wall. We're always trying to get people to give us feedback in real time. Uh, and, and that helps. Uh, one of the, the, the spin-offs that came out just out of the blue from making phone calls and so on was finding out that the local hospitals needed food and they needed to be, uh, uh, you know, they, they asked us if we could, we could help them. And at one point we were serving between two and 500 meals a day to three different hospitals. And um, then local community get to hear about this. Well, well actually one of the things was, was before we started this, I, a lot of the team members that we, we uh, our, our team, uh, half our team went back home. They, you know, they, they were at stages where 
you know, do I stay in England? Do I not stay in England? We have Brexit coming in. There was all that uncertainty about things and half the team left. So we were really working on a skeleton crew. And so we said, okay, look, I'm not going to tell you that we have to do this work, but do you want to do it? And they all said, oh, we really want to do this. This would be wonderful, supporting the locals, supporting sick people in the hospital and so on, you know, especially by supporting the, the, the actual workers in the hospital. I think that, that really drove morale, uh, 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 you know, in a, in a really positive way. Uh, and not just that, but then customers got to learn that we were doing that. And our friend who here, Paco, who's a, a regular customer, that's his son there. Uh, here with him and they found out that we were serving the hospitals and he used to have a thing called pizza friday in his office and he just sold his company and so he said every friday they used to bring the best pizza they could find in town to the office and feed the whole office all together and everyone would come in in their jeans and so on and he said i want to do pizza friday and we uh, my company is going to donate as many pizzas as you want and they would donate 200 pizzas uh, every friday they would pay for them uh, which helped us enormously and um, uh, we were able to s supply and phone the phone the hospital and say, what do you want? And they could actually take their own orders and, 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 and as a delivery. And then he came down often. And uh, there's Bobby between us, uh, the, uh, our cocker spaniel. Um, uh, who, who, she'd come with us all the time as well. And uh, yeah, Paco would come down and help serve the, the, um, the, the hospitals. And, and, and that was really, really lovely. And get, kind of going into this whole uh, talk about this innovation thing, we we started to get very in the early days before we discovered agile. I think one of the, one of the biggest problems um, we had was that I'm just going to see if I can just switch over to draw something for you. When we first started the business, we were innovating every single day. Every, everything we did was about innovation and uh, everything was new. And we would uh, uh, constantly, you know, we had a totally flat organization. We would have team members uh, uh, cooking, running upstairs, looking at the customers, seeing what their reaction was, feeding back that information uh, uh, to the rest of the team and then uh, 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 iterating uh, product every single day. And there was a point where we started to actually find out there was a whole, there was a core of, products that customers really liked, and there was a certain way that customers liked to be served. This is going back 26 years. So we decided at that point, we really needed to start creating checklists and standard operating procedures for all of everything that we did. And that was very good in the, in the early part because it started allowing us to standardize what we were doing. But it got to a point where we, kind of drew a line around it and we I drew an, an, another drawing up here before and we we created this kind of standard operating procedure police there was this police force that was not allowing anything to change we had to keep everything the same and I think that was the time when the companies actually started to die and that was about probably 10 years into, into the, the formation of the company. Innovation went down to virtually nil. And everything was about the standard operating procedure police. And so we, we got to a point where we, when we started working with Agile, we decided to, no, actually, that's wrong. Let me just draw it again. We wanted to create this sort of middle point between, so we were innovating, but we also had standard operating procedures. And we wanted to make, create this, this middle point. And if I go on to this next slide, I think it, it shows it better. So we had our standard operating procedures, our repetitive work that we were doing. We were trying to innovate and we were trying to actually create within the structure of the work, we were trying to create some sort of innovation, some sort of improvement happening on a very regular cadence. And every now and then we would try something new and it would be so radical, it would just be a total innovation. And at that point, we had to go back and actually create a, total, uh, a, a totally new uh, uh, 
recipe or standard operating procedure or way of doing something, then standardize it and document it. But at the same time, as soon as we did that, we started to uh, actually build into the structure of our day-to-day uh, uh, life, the, um, uh, this kind of continual improvement. And going back onto that, that the Mobius loop, when we use Mobius, it forces us constantly to go back to the why, the who, come back to our outcomes, see if it's still relevant. Is there a better way of us doing it? And we're kind of really manipulating that whole loop into the Scrum framework and find it very, very, very effective. But what was really interesting was, was uh, when I was co-teaching a class with uh, Gabrielle uh, uh, about a month, month and a half ago, and uh, we were uh, running this sort of disruption loop in the class. And I was very uh, uh, honored that the class decided to use the restaurant as the case study that they wanted to say, okay, well, you know, if, if we were running the restaurant together as a team, you know, the whole class was, was involved in this. What would, what would a, when would you need to totally disrupt the business, uh, you know, and, and B, how could we do it? And this became part of our, 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 our exercise uh, uh, for the class. And so I was saying, well, I'm actually quite worried that in September, October, November, we may get locked down again. And the government, especially recently, you know, they, they were talking about it at, at the time of this class. So they would talk about, oh, well, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with the vaccines. We may have to lock you down again. I've got personal guarantees on the, on the leases. We've got another 15 years to run and the rent's got to be paid. So what do I do if they really do shut us down? Do we go back to being a deli? Because in the second lockdown, Delhi wasn't quite as, as effective as in the first lockdown because everybody else had jumped in the bandwagon. So we needed to innovate again. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, we can't run a, a Delhi. We, we, we need to innovate more. We had, need to think up, uh, you know, uh, possible. I don't really like to have uh, uh, contingency plans because I think that, we, you know, we, we, we end up use, giving ourselves ex- excuses for not, not succeeding. But when you get a situation where government can actually say to you, you can't, uh, uh, operate your business anymore you've got to put something in place and so we were chatting away and they were, I was being interviewed and they were saying well you know part of the um, uh, um, when we started training uh, uh, scrum and agile practices in the restaurant we used to run these uh, five hour work sh- work- workshops that would uh, we take a, 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 a specific job that needed to be done uh, by the uh, around the restaurant and we get the whole team in and, and we would simulate a whole week's worth of work in five hours and uh, it was a great training training uh, um, exercise and the uh, class said you know why don't you put it out to the community that if you open the restaurant as a, an agile training center uh, you know, what, you know, would that be something people would be interested in? So we uh, sent out uh, uh, 10 uh, LinkedIn messages to 10 of my contacts, which uh, read uh, yeah, one of these examples was, uh, hi, Chris, hope you're well. Um, I, but a quick question for you. Uh, learn to apply agile to hospitality if you can make it work in a restaurant, you can make it work anywhere, exclamation mark. Uh, what do you take away from this description? Is the statement clear? Is it compelling? Does it make you curious to know more? I sent that out to 10 people just to see what happened. And I was going, due to go back into the class the next day to tell them you know, what happened. And somebody, a friend of mine uh, got in touch, said, you've got to speak to my partner. He's just opened 25 units uh, 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 of a really interesting uh, 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 newspaper store, but in in, in uh, subway stations, they've got a, a whole load of uh, catering staff. They're very hospitality driven, and uh, I think you should meet him because we'd like you to uh, to uh, pitch that whole idea with him. And I ended up getting on a call with him the next day, discussing uh, the possibility. Of, you know, they've got a new unit opening up in Japan and all, all over the world. They're going to open up. I think they they plan to open several hundred units. And they were looking for an agile framework to use. And they were really, really interested, A, in helping us to do something with the London unit, but also the possibility of opening something in New York or Florida. So, and, and it was just really amazing how just being playful with the, this exercise and uh, sort of throwing it out there in, 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 and 
it, it wasn't serious, it wasn't a serious request at all, has led to the potential of actually us, us starting a new business. I think, Gabrielle, you, you were particularly excited by that when you're on that, that class. As a... Yeah, well, I do love it. The fact that, you know, you get all these people just thinking differently. You just say, you know, one of the questions is, what if there is no restaurant? What would you do very differently? And I think we get so busy doing business as usual, getting in our sort of daily way of doing things that we do lots of small innovations and think we're really innovating. But as soon as you ask that quite clarifying question and what would it take to be an exponential organisation, one that's like going to do 10 times more or something very different, reach more people, you think differently. So sometimes it's that disruptor loop, you know, getting people to step back um, mm. and just push themselves into a different way of thinking. I think that really helps. Yeah, one of the things I forgot to say, uh, which I just slipped, slipped back a couple of, um, you know, we were talking here about here, um, we got so busy doing our business as usual that the teams constantly said, we don't have any time for any in innovative work. And the way we got around that was literally just telling the teams, you know, could I have half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening? And um, uh, uh, they said, yeah, you probably could. And so we took an hour a day, which is seven hours a week. But even just in the kitchen alone, that was if you multiply that by the people hours that were working in the kitchen, that was like between 28 and 35 hours a week of innovation where we would have innovation discussions. And that was really transformative. So just doing it on a day by day basis. But when you get to that point where we go back and we actually say, no, come on, how what, yeah, what would happen if we couldn't operate as a as a restaurant or what would happen if? you know, we had no kitchen or whatever it might be. Those questions are really, really, really powerful. And uh, I think they actually just change, even, even if you don't make the big, those changes, they change the way you look at the business. And, and that feeling of, of um, being much more in control, you know, it's just, I know, we know we have the tools now to pretty much do anything we want to do and quickly evaluate whether this is working or not. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're now, I was saying to Gabrielle, we're now going to, uh, we're running every single procedure of the restaurant through the loop to test it. And we could do that really, really quickly. So you could do it on a micro level or on a macro level. And I, I find it really, really fascinating and very exciting to uh, plug all, all of the different parts into Mobius. Uh, uh, and it's, I think it helps people. It's really helped me with my teams uh, especially the people who don't speak very good English. Uh, it's helped me to sort of map it out and explain to them in much clearer, simpler ways exactly what we're doing on a day-by-day you know, -day basis. Yeah, one of the great things when we discovered all these, um, uh, we looked at these standard operating procedures was that there is, because a lot of them were redundant or parts of them were redundant and they became, they were pleased to such an extent that nobody else was allowed access to them. And so we didn't really know what anybody in a small restaurant is crazy. I didn't know what 30, 40% of my team were doing half the time because they had their little, their little arena. And when we really analyzed it and started looking at it and, and, and put everything under, under the microscope, we realized that in some instances, 30% of the work was what we term as dark work. And it was just work not needed by the company anymore. And it had once upon a time had a very valid uh, uh, purpose. And, and yet now it wasn't relevant to what we were doing on a day by day basis, but it was still getting done because it wasn't being made visible. And so, you know, that was one of the dangers, especially when you have this deep hierarchical structure of people just not noticing things anymore. And um, we, we eliminated enormous amount of work that wasn't needed and uh, in fact needed slightly less people. So when people left the team, we didn't have to replace them. And we were able to then give more money to the team members, or we gave them in a short period of time, we gave them a 10% increase in, in salaries. And so you know, the, the spin-offs are incredible when you really look at it. And it's just a matter of deconstructing everything and really looking at everything from a new, new perspective but not policing things too much and not scaring people away from being in innovative or trying new things. I think that's the, the, the real problem. Once you get really well established in these deep legacy organizations, they start to create these systems that just can't be challenged anymore. And everybody gets so 
caught up in their day-to-day work, their business as usual. Thank you, Ricardo. Brilliant. Thank you.